The Dharma, incomparably profound and exquisite, is rarely met with even in hundreds of thousands of millions of kalpas. We now can see it, hear it, accept and hold it. May we realize the true mind of the Tathagata. Today is the seventh day, not quite the final day, of this eight-day sashin here at Mountain Gate in Rohatsu uh, in December 2020. The sashin that uh, remembers the Buddha doing his own deep, deep, deep search for truth. And that's why it goes into the eighth day, because uh, that's what happened with him. For seven nights and eight days, he, he searched within. And early on, he ran into all kinds of challenges. Uh, and so do we. Until we begin to, to see through it. And we recognize that um, it's like the weather practice. We just keep going deeper and deeper and deeper. And we let the, the clouds go by. We let the sun shine. We let the storms happen. And we just keep doing our practice more and more deeply, becoming more and more free, because that's what practice does for us. We become more and more free. Free of what? Well, we go through our lives in a conditioned uh, experience. We have ideas about ourselves. Some of them are fluid and some of them are quite rigid. And the uh, rigid ones cause us all kinds of challenges because we react out of them uh, rather than out of a profound awareness and presence in whatever the situation is. And so we, uh, unwittingly cause pain and suffering to ourselves and others. And it's about letting go these knee-jerk reactions by seeing increasingly clearly how things really are, who we really are. And that makes a big difference. So here we are with Hawkwing's Rohatsu's exhortations on the seventh night. <clears throat> Although it's not quite the seventh night yet, but we only have a few more hours and it will be. The master said, when a child leaves home to become a monk, it is said his family members for the next nine generations are reborn into a deva existence. He must be a genuine monk, though, one of, of those in whom a great burning vow to save all beings wells up from within, firing him with fierce courage to go forward and sever the roots to life, uh, artificial life, we should say, so that true dharma nature appears suddenly before his eyes. Such a person is an authentic monk, for his family rebirth in the deva realms is no empty saying. It will become a joyous reality. We can say, uh, yeah, sure, that's a, a nice fairy tale. But in reality, the more we change in positive directions, the more we let go and are able to respond rather than react to situations as we move through life, the more that influences everyone, seen and unseen. It is, it is, very important to recognize that. And, and as we go deeper in our practice and find ourselves living more freely in the sense of uh, more ethically, more uh, clearly, more let go of any, any conditioning reflexes that would cause us to simply react and um, uh, sort of hit first before we get hit because we're assuming we're going to get hit. Whereas perhaps the situation has got nothing to do with that. And instead, when we can see clearly where the situation really resides, we can respond. And, and that not only is something that, that uh, lets us 
not create the kind of suffering we might otherwise create, but it also serves as a model and in inspiration for others. Moreover, instead of putting negative energy into the universe, we express positive energy, clear, compassionate, wise energy. It is quite real. Uh, we don't necessarily see the effects of it until we've been doing practice for quite a while, but it does, it does happen. And you've heard, uh, heard me mention a number of examples of this. For example, when Harada Roshi was a monk at Chofukuchi, he was um, heading a work uh, team outside the, the main gate of the, the temple, but still on temple property. And it seemed that there were homeless people living on the, on the property, and the homeless people felt that the temple was robbing them of water. And so the leader, supposed leader, apparent leader of this group of homeless people, came in a fit of great rage and accosted Harada. And uh, as a person who was standing nearby and witnessed the whole encounter, told me personally, uh, the man was uh, clearly no stranger to violence, and he was right in the Roshi's face. He himself red-faced, furious, screaming at the Roshi. And what did the Roshi do? What would you have done? If this guy had, had, had suddenly come up to you and, and was uh, expressing in rather intense ways a grievance that uh, did, did not seem apparently legitimate, what would you have done? Well, the Roshi, first of all, stood there quietly, looking at the man with honor, and attention. And as, uh, as I was told about this, it appeared that the Roshi was becoming increasingly quiet within. And what that did was completely defuse the situation. The man simply began to rant down his, his rage and eventually they were able to speak quietly and the man went away. All this because of how Harada responded. We could assume that if we were in a situation like that, uh, we might get a bit red-faced ourselves. We might um, start trying to argue with the guy. Uh, we might even uh, be ready to punch him if he punched us, and it, it could end up in a, a downright brawl. But instead, Dosan, as he was known then, clearly felt no need to do anything but pay clear attention to this man, honoring his concerns. And that was deeply felt. And so the situation turned out very, very differently. And then, of course, there's the, the story of why Harada, young Harada, ended up becoming a Zen teacher, even though growing up in a, in a Zen temple, his father was a priest. And he, he, he had no interest whatsoever in living a life as a professional priest. Of course, he was ordained, um, as was his older brother. Uh, that's classic. But um, growing up, he, he could choose not to uh, do anything about that ordination and simply live lay life. And uh, his brother had uh, actually gotten a job. He was what was known as a salary man, um, an office worker. And uh, when one day when, when young Harada was heading off to school, 
uh, in Kyoto. He was living in Nara. But it's quite common for uh, Japanese school kids, and by this time, I think he was in either high school or college, uh, to take the train and go into a different city for school. And so that's what he, he did, although it was a bus that he took. And uh, he took an earlier bus than usual because he needed to do this errand for his father, which was to take some papers to a particular temple within the great temple complex of Myoshinji, the headquarter temple for Rinzai. Uh, and so he, he got on the bus and it was a rush hour. And uh, at a certain point, uh, an, an older man in priest robes got on the bus, quietly walked to the back of the bus, and sat silently, deeply, silently reading a book. And young Harada was surprised by this guy because here he was in priest robes, and yet he didn't appear to be like any priest uh, Harada had, had known. Uh, it was by that time, of course, post Meiji Restoration, and, and so uh, a lot of temples had basically died or had become as owned by the people who supported them. And the priests that were incumbent in those temples simply served as funeral directors. They didn't have full training, full Zen training. They had enough training that they could give a nice little Dharma talk and conduct some ceremonies, mostly funerals. And they were not considered a very high class occupation in Japan. So that's what his impression was. And he had no interest in doing that. He wanted to become a psychologist because he felt that there were things about his personality he didn't like and he wanted to change them. And he thought that becoming a, a psychologist would, would make that possible. He'd learn how to do that. But it all changed when he saw who it was coming onto that bus a priest in robes who is different from all the others. He was not clearly a, just a funeral director. He was somebody of deep presence. And that was not lost on young Hara. And so um, after Hara finished school, finished college actually it was, uh, he walked the many miles to Kobe, where Shofukuji Temple was, and began training with that very priest who was Yamaramu Moroshi. So a chance encounter with, with somebody's energy, somebody's clear, deep, let go energy, was enough to change the course of his life. Jacques Lusseron in Buchenwald, before he grew so ill that they took him away to die, uh, people were taking advantage of the fact that he was blind and stealing his crusts of bread so that he was eating even less food than the rest of them were. Uh, and, and they were ritually starved, basically. And yet, once he had that awakening experience, no one stole his bread anymore. And instead, they woke him up in the middle of the night to lead him to people who were freaking out because his simple presence was able to calm people down. This is, this is the, the thing that can happen. Uh, when we uncover our true self, even a, a bit of it, and in the process of doing that, it's necessarily we have to let go where, where we are caught, um, at least to a certain point. And of course, this is a whole long process, uh, I would say lifetimes long process of letting go, seeing more and more clearly and bringing our behavior, our perceptions into line with what we realize on the cushion. Or sometimes we realize it off the cushion as a result of the work we've done on the cushion.
This is why our practice is so vital. Because it makes a difference for everyone. And so when Hawkwing says that nine generations of our family is going to be born in the Deva realm, um, that's one way of expressing the fact that because we are uh, letting go the negative conditioning that would cause us to, uh, or inspire us, or in, uh, make us uh, behave in, in suffering producing ways it 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 is felt all around and it impacts and inspires others particularly people who are close to us in and uh, have a sort of front row seat let me tell you <clears throat> about a mother from the province of harima on the night she conceived, she vowed that if she should give birth to a son, she would give him to the priesthood. That same night, an old man appeared to her in a dream and said, I'm an ancestor of yours born nine generations ago. When I died, I entered the world of the dead where I've been undergoing endless suffering. But on the strength of the wonderful vow you've just made, I will finally be able to escape the torments of hell. There was a priest named Ryozan, who lived in the province of Kai and engaged in the training of monks. One night, as the assembly was doing Zazen during Aroha Susashin, the spirit of his dead mother suddenly appeared to him. Grasping a sword in her hand, she rushed at him and stabbed him in the side. Emitting a loud roar, he toppled over as if he was dead, vomiting blood, and did not regain consciousness for a long time. That must have shaken up the Sangha. The next day, he, hid, he bid farewell to his monks and set out on a pilgrimage. He carried nothing but three robes and a begging bowl and slept out in the open, exposed to the elements. He wandered for years, going from teacher to teacher in his pursuit of the way. His jhana, his meditation, attained an exceptional depth and maturity. And one day, as he was about to enter samadhi, his mother appeared again. When he raised his eyes to see her, she vanished. Later, she appeared again, when he was deeply immersed in a samadhi as vast and tranquil as the great ocean. This time, she spoke. After I died and descended into the world of the dead, the demon lictors all treated me with great respect as the mother of a monk. I experienced no suffering or torment at all. Then, alas, you began to make a name for yourself as a teacher. And the lictors all began to say, we thought she was the mother of a priest, but it turns out she spawned a scoundrel. They began to inflict terrible suffering on me, iron bars, heavy iron shackles. I grew to hate you with such bitterness. It seemed to penetrate my very bones. That's why I came and stabbed you that night. You had a change of heart and left the temple, set out on a pilgrimage. When I visited you the next time, I saw immediately the thoughts of birth and death still lingered in your mind, so I disappeared. But now there's an almost transparent clarity to your meditation and prajna wisdom. My suffering has also ended. I can now be reborn into the Deva realms. This time, I've come to thank you. You heard what that woman said, didn't you? All of you have mothers of your own. You've got brothers and sisters, grandparents, relatives of various kinds. If you counted up all the ancestors who lived before you, their number would reach into the tens of millions. Well, at this very moment, they're confined within the cycle of birth and death, undergoing interminable, unspeakable torment. It, was, it would be hard to imagine their eagerness for you to break through and attain the way. They are like people in the midst of a parching drought, scanning the skies for signs of rain. If you just sit there doing Zazen, going through the motions because you haven't brought forth the great Bodhisattva vow, how can you bear to look them in the face? Time waits for no one. You can't let a single hour pass in vain. Strive hard, strive hard. 
And that is the great Zen master Hakui. So all these days we've been working, searching for the truth of who we are. And I'd like now to share just a couple of things to give you some hints. These, um, most of these come from the Tibetan tradition, but one of them, of course, is uh, Huang Po. First, Introduction to the Nature of Mind by Dzogchen Pema Kalsang Rinpoche. And this is what he says. All phenomena of samsara are apparent. In other words, we think we're going through stuff and it seems to be going through stuff in our daily life, yet uniformly non-existent like last night's dream and are nothing other than part of the expressivity of enlightened mind. Like the sun and sunlight, all phenomena of nirvana have the perfect spontaneously present nature of awakening itself. Wisdom that fully pervades all of samsara and nirvana. Samsara, of course, is our, our, our regularly perceived uh, daily life, full of some nice things and some not so nice things. Some happiness and some pain and suffering. As long as someone is a sentient being possessed of a mind stream, the unaltered and unadulterated essence of mind itself, the true natural state is the threefold indivisible wisdom of empty essence, luminous nature, and all-pervading compassion. That is what we are uncovering with our Zazen. That is what everyone is in down with from the very beginning. This is who we are, beneath all the conditioning. Once more, as long as someone is a sentient being possessed of a not mind stream, the unaltered and unadulterated essence of mind itself, the true natural state is the threefold indivisible wisdom of empty essence, luminous nature, and all pervasive compassion. And at some level, we sense, maybe not in detail, but we sense something like that, that there is an, another view, that there is freedom. And of course, we, we haven't really known how to, how to manage to open to it. And, there may be some questions in our mind about whether, whether it's real or not. And yet, everything else is like a dream. Change is possible. We are enabled with the capacity to uncover this innate compassion, wisdom, clarity, luminous essence and to live from that basis. And this is why we do Sashin. And at this point in Sashin, we have gone deep. It's a matter of taking that final step and realizing and you can do it. Here is what uh, Toku Urgin Rinpoche says uh, in, in his teaching, Rainbow Painting. Toku 
Orkian Rinpoche, as you know, is the father, was the father, he's, he's now dead, but was the father of Yonggi Mingyi Rinpoche. And here under the title space, the basic principles in the innermost Dzogchen teachings are space and awareness. In Tibetan, ying and rigpa. Ying is defined as unconstructed space devoid of concepts. While rigpa means the knowing of that basic space. And when we chant the Prajnaparamita, form is emptiness, emptiness is form. This is part of what is being said here. And that is the core teaching of the Buddha. Again, let's, let's share once more that amazing teaching. As long as someone is a sentient being possessed of a mind stream, the unaltered and unadulterated essence of mind itself, the true natural state, is the threefold indivisible wisdom of empty essence, luminous nature, and all pervasive compassion. And then from the Chinese Chan or Zen master, Huang Po. Somewhere in here. Let's see where he is. All Buddhas and all ordinary beings are nothing but the one mind. This mind is beginningless and endless, unborn and indestructible. It has no color or shape, neither exists nor doesn't exist, isn't old or new, young or short, long or short, large or small, since it transcends all measures, limits, names, and comparisons. It is what you see in front of you, but what you see in front of you closer than your own eyes. Start to think about it and immediately you're mistaken. It is like the boundless void which can't be fathomed or me measured. The one mind is the Buddha and there is no distinction between Buddha and ordinary beings except that ordinary beings are attached to forms and thus seek for Buddhahood outside themselves. This pure mind, which is the source of all things, shines forever with a radiance of its own perfection. And that is who you really are. And that is something that you can uncover and live from. In order to do it, it's essential to let go, at least momentarily, everything. But then, to be truthful, when you die, you will have no choice. Everything will be let go of. That you, you can't haul it into death. You can scramble and try, but People who know deeply what life and death are die seamlessly with no fear, with no struggle. And that can be you as well. If you comprehend deeply enough who you really are, search for that face before your parents were born.
and keep on searching. And when you open to some level of truth in it, bring that truth to life in your daily life. Don't stick it up on the bookshelf somewhere to admire. Live it. And in that way, you and the universe is transformed. This is our amazing gift. And it is so heartening that all of you are here all this time to realize it. So in these last hours of Sashin, because Sashin will not open and not be over until uh, tomorrow morning. You have such power based on all the Zazen you've done up until now. Such clarity, whether it real it feels like that or not, ignore what it feels like. Keep seeking, keep extending that out breath and reaching beyond for you don't know what, but you know that something, something is worth opening to, and it is. So we still have about 16 minutes left in this period. I thank you for listening, and we'll stop now and recite the four vows. <clears throat>